Typically, it is advisable to dispense with labels, especially political labels, as invariably all colloquial usage and understanding of said labels are often misleading, if not entirely inaccurate. It is with much tribulation that I embark on exploring my own preferred label of ultra. As a historicist, I advocate grounding terms within their proper context, in both time and space, to avoid confusion. Unfortunately, this is an unrealistic expectation, and so I understand that my usage of various terms may conflict with many of my viewers' preconceptions, at least if I don't always rush to define my terms. That, and there exists a temptation Indeed, there is an established historiographical tradition for a handy ontology of history where everything can be easily assigned to broad, ready-made categories. Take the term capitalism, for example. Such a term has a different meaning to different people at different times, and it is the role of the historian to simultaneously understand multiple definitions for a single term, and yet impart these terms to a readership in a fashion that is intelligible, and yet salient in its given context. Before arriving at my definition of ultra, the purpose of the video, it is necessary to make intelligible, or at least I hope, a selection of preliminary terms. Take the political left and right, for example. Today, especially when used by journalists, Definitions of left and right have little internal consistency, and are often unintelligible within their given context. Usage of the term the right in particular is intended to resonate on an emotional level, playing to an audience's prejudices rather than communicating a coherent set of policy propositions. So when I use the term left and right on this channel, I am aware of an audience's preconceptions, and yet I choose to bypass them, as such preconceptions aren't useful to communicating something intelligible. Hence why I can describe Leon Trotsky as on the left, and Nikolai Bukhalin as on the right, despite both being Soviet communists. The left and the right can only be construed through a post-revolutionary paradigm. The left pursues the purity of the abstract, the right, realism. The dead centre compromises between these two positions. Labels such as far-left and centre-left are simply gradations of radicalism. By post-revolutionary, I mean any political order that has substituted the rule of God for the pursuit of utopia. Under the rule of God, especially of the Catholic kind, the relevant distinction is between orthodox and heterodox. Conversely, Marxism, positivism, and transhumanism may qualify as examples of the pursuit of utopia. But the most relevant post-revolutionary order for the sake of the terms left and right is that of the French Revolution. It is from the French Revolution that such terms originated, from the Isles of the National Convention. 1792 was declared the year zero for the French Republic, the beginning of the new history. Royalism was exorcised from the body politic. From the single revolutionary uniparty, the Mountain, emerged a faction of moderates, the right, sometimes lumped together as the group the Girondists, and the Mountain's rump, lumped together as the Jacobins, the new left. Despite France having been a monarchy in that very year, permitted political discourse, or the Overton window, was now exclusively republican. A year later, the window of discourse was limited further to exclude the Girondists. Now the left were Hebetists, and the right were Dantonists, and so on. Former revolutionaries were now anathematized, designated as counter-revolutionaries. This is to say that left and right are intrinsically revolutionary in origin, and situationally adaptive. 
In today's discourse, the window of discourse pertains to democratic parties, following the democratic revolution in the early 20th century. Today it is clear to see that what is meant as democracy and the corresponding window of discourse is in a state of dramatic flux. The term conservative, though prolific, is a term to be avoided at all costs as a universal and timeless category. Burke, the conservative philosopher, arises out of a subset of weak history, but his philosophy is adaptive enough to correlate to both the conservatism, or conservation rather, of any pre-existing political order, and also the right within a post-revolutionary paradigm, i.e. conserving the existing gains of the revolution. Conservatism is, and always was therefore, a paradox. Liberal as a term is even more insidious, gaining momentum as a political label in the early 19th century. Liberal is simultaneously progressive in the Whig tradition, liberal as intolerant in the non-conformist tradition in England, libertine as in permissive, and for liberty, meaning the protection of natural rights at the expense of the state. By the 20th century, liberalism too had revealed itself as a paradox, dividing and dooming the liberal movement in Great Britain. In modern America, the terms liberal and conservative are arbitrary, beyond demonstrating an affiliation with the Blue Party or the Red Party. In stark contrast to liberal and conservative, left and right, we arrive at ultra. Ultra, as well as the term reactionary, a descriptor I will accept begrudgingly despite its lack of precision, is also defined within the context of a revolutionary paradigm, but apart from it, and in opposition to it. I will take ultra over reactionary for its etymological simplicity, for ultra in Latin simply means beyond, yet within the context of radicalism it can mean further. Situating ultra within its historical context, the ultras were a political faction led by the Comte d'Artois, later Charles X of France, frustrated by the regime of Louis XVIII, his brother, the restoration following the revolution, yet the restoration that restored nothing. The ultras perceived the reign of Louis XVIII as attempting to harmonise the legacy of the revolution with the cause of royalism in France, as indeed Napoleon had done previously with Bonapartism. Royalism, as with Bonapartism, was now situated within the right of the revolutionary paradigm. Once, royalism had been synonymous with loyalty to the king, who in turn was meant as the antithesis of the revolution, the pursuit of the ideal version of kingship. The ultras were attempting to counter a newly emergent political paradox, loyalty to a king who was no longer himself a royalist. To their royalism, the ultras added the word plus, meaning more, plus royalist que le roi, more royalist than the king. Moreover, in contrast to the efforts of conservatives to conserve political institutions, even those inherited from revolutionary governments. As the ultra-royalists had been willing to rake their king over the coals, once they found themselves the ascendant faction in the French Chamber of Deputies, the heir to the Convention, the Legislative, Le Legislative Assembly, and the Legislative Corps, they declared the chamber introvable unfindable, repudiating the legacy of this revolutionary institution. Ultras were thus their own variety of ideological purists, but beyond the revolutionary paradigm they could hardly be called leftist. The cause of the ultras proved as prophetic as it was doomed, for the cause of the Restoration monarchy was succeeded by the July monarchy that made no secret in associating itself with the revolutionary right. Combined to the ultras, we have the association with royalism. In my personal labelling scheme, ultra takes precedence over royalism. The former is a constant, the latter for me is a flirtation. Royalism is inextricable from the cause of kingship. 
It is for this reason that the term is far more precise and useful than the term monarchist. Again, returning to etymology, the origin of words, the monarch is simply a sole ruler, and so a king cannot have exclusive claim over that word, though in modern parlance, rather absurdly, they have become interchangeable. I say absurdly because all modern political systems have tended towards monarchy, though claiming to be democracies or republics. The American presidency, or the German chancellorship, for example, are far more convincing monarchies than that of the British kingship. Presuppositions such as hereditary versus elective have always been supplemental qualifiers to these systems, and historically are not intrinsic to the nature of monarchy or kingship. Moreover, situating such terms within their historical context, royalist, for the denizen of England, has a definite meaning, the cause of King Charles I against Parliament in the English Civil War. The cause of King Charles I himself is a notable forerunner for the politics of the ultras. Though it wasn't evident during the course of the conflict, the result of the Civil War was ultimately a contest between two monarchies, that of Charles and that of Oliver Cromwell. Such should be enough to eliminate the intimate association between monarchism and royalism. Added to the considerations of an ultra-royalist are further supplementary associations with legitimism and Catholicism. Legitimism is held to be consistent with the cause of traditional kingship, though strictly a traditional kingship under a specific legitimate dynasty. Legitimate, for said dynasties were deposed by upstarts, often for defending the cause of traditional kingship. Such instances would be the Jacobites in England, Scotland and Ireland, the Bourbons in France, and the Carlists in Spain. For the Jacobites, the cause of English legitimism would evolve into High Toryism, as opposed to Toryism, synonymous with the British Conservative Party, a party with no legitimist principles, or really any principles whatsoever. Nevertheless, due to its association with and dependence on the figure of the pretender, a figure of potentially any ideological stripe, legitimism is not intrinsically ultra-royalist, as evidence with the current crisis in the Carlist movement. Though my own Catholicism should be clearly in evidence, the term ultra needn't be synonymous with the cause of Catholicism. Historically, the association was clear, as in the ultra's very motto, more royalist than the king, more Catholic than the pope. The crisis in the modern Catholic Church is a subject for another time. But as I understand the role between kingship and the papacy, my sympathies have always tended towards the imperialists, or the Ghibelline faction of the medieval ages. Here, the temporal prerogatives of the Pope were meant to augment the Christian Emperor, rather than the two powers existing in a state of constant conflict. For the Ghibellines, there is a Catholic version of Symphonia, if you will, a concept associated with the Orthodox Emperors, and therefore ultra-royalism can be associated with Orthodoxy. Indeed, Symphonia, to my mind, is a more coherent concept uh, than the modern concept of integralism. For the ultras, an association with Ghibellinism takes on a new meaning. Beyond a parochial royalism, ultra here means beyond the king, and therefore as aspiring to God, the king on earth as subject to Christ as king. Moreover, the ultra is aspiring beyond the ruler of his respective nation to the figure of the emperor, who is the temporal head of all Christendom. Within the Guelph conception, the figure of the emperor is substituted for the pope, as in Innocent III's allegory of the sun and the moon. The ultra thus stands against the revolution, defying the false dichotomy between left and right, holding the king accountable in one sense to a pure conception of royalism, which in turn lends itself to subordination to a sacred authority, beyond even that of the ideals of kingship, or any authority on earth.